If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to imply Welcome to Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. This cable access pro program is part of our effort to create a just society based on a sustainable, actable economy. Our guest today is Ted Gleichman, chair of the Beyond LNG Committee of the Oregon Sierra Club. Ted was on our program just a few weeks ago with Madeline Elder, who is president of Local 7901 Communication Workers of America. They were discussing the developing Blue-Green Alliance opposing the Trans-Pacific Partnership and other, other so-called free trade, or as we call them, corporate trade agreement. So, uh, Ted, welcome back to the program. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, good. So you have a prepared uh, presentation for us today uh, regarding methane, which you are calling the most elegant and tangled hydrocarbon. Yes, and my presentation I call methane yin and yang. All right, go for so it. Methane is amazing and horrifying simultaneously. And now we need to understand that because methane, natural gas, is one of the most important molecules of our planet and its significance will only grow for the duration. Methane, CH4, is not the most important molecule, of course, that's water, obviously, H2O. And we animals are all very fond of elemental oxygen, O2. And our tomatoes and trees depend heavily on carbon dioxide, CO2, We'll come back to CO2. Uh, so let's say that methane is one of the big four. CH4, one carbon atom with four hydrogen ions bonded to it. CH4 is the first hydrocarbon, the most fundamental, the simplest. All the other fossil fuels build from there. Next is ethane, C2H6, then propane, C3H8, then butane, C4H10, and on up in complexity from there. So why is methane, a colorless, odorless gas, so special and why is it so important? Because for us now, it has a binary nature. It is both a one and a zero. Along with what we have done to ourselves with carbon dioxide, we have restructured our world to trap ourselves in methane's yin and yang. So think about that while we talk through these uh, binary battles. Yin, the female energy, generally positive, but always including a kernel of yang, the male energy, much too negative in our culture, but always embodying a smidgen of yin. Yin and yang, blending and flowing together, pulling apart, simultaneously separate and the same. And for the binary conflicts in CH4, you get to decide which is yin and which is yang in this metaphor, and where this metaphor breaks down completely, as most do over time. Methane is both the safest and the most destructive hydrocarbon. It's the safest because when CH4 is burned in the presence of O2, the only outputs are heat, H2O, and CO2. You can scramble eggs with it because all you get is a little bit of water vapor and some carbon dioxide for your houseplants. That's why in the early, early 20th century, when it became possible to convert from wood stoves and even coal stoves, both with mandatory chimneys that methane does not require, uh, a saying developed that became a metaphor for progress. Now you're cooking with gas. But it's also the most destructive fossil fuel, molecule for molecule. It's not because of the CO2 that it puts out when it's burned. We'll come back to that. No, it's because unburned, Methane is a much more potent heat-trapping greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Specifically, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, assesses methane impact over a 20-year period, molecule for molecule, as having a global warming potential 86 times greater than carbon dioxide. Not 86%, 86 times. Over a 100-year period, methane presents a global warming effect 34 times that of carbon dioxide, a massive imbalance with dangerous ramifications. But we don't have 100 years. The next 20 years are what really matters, and perhaps even less than that. Which leads us to the next binary battle, 
clean and dirty. The natural gas industry tells us constantly how clean methane is, since it generally won't kill you in your kitchen. Unless, of course, uh, one of two things happens. First, it can blow up when your pilot light blows out and the methane gas pools and finds another source of ignition, which happens regularly, although not frequently. Or if it leaks out without igniting and you breathe it, turns out there's no O2 in it and your lungs are not nourished. But I digress. In our, in our new warming world, no fossil fuel is clean. To pitch methane as putting out only about half as much carbon dioxide as coal, say, when we burn it for electricity or any other purpose is a complete red herring for two reasons. First, any source of carbon dioxide is just another dirty fuel now. But more importantly, methane leaks everywhere throughout the natural gas supply chain. It leaks, or worse, is intentionally vented at the wellhead in drilling and production. It leaks in transmission, in processing and refining, and in distribution by pipelines to the end, end users. It leaks everywhere. So yes, methane puts out about 50% less CO2 when we burn it, but 86 times, 8,600% more heat trapping potential when it flows into the atmosphere unburned. Which leads us to climate solutions and climate disruption. Because of fugitive methane emissions, methane can never help prevent global warming. And the schemes to use more and more of it for electricity, for transportation, and in many ways the worst of all for export as liquefied natural gas are devastating contributors to climate disruption. Natural gas production and consumption and liquefied natural gas exports can never be characterized as climate solutions. We know that the true climate solutions require massive reductions in fossil fuels use urgently and massive social and economic change to make that feasible and healthy. The same sorts of programs that the Alliance for Democracy is such uh, a major uh, contributor to the conversation on. So business as usual, natural gas is not a bridge to the future. We used to believe that. We used to think that natural gas would get us through the conversion off of coal and oil to the truly clean, sustainable, renewable energy systems we all know we need along with the other ways we need to end the overwhelming preponderance of fossil fuel use, like moving to healthy locavore agriculture. But natural gas, like every fossil fuel, is inherently destructive and therefore not a bridge. Rather, as Sierra Club Executive Director Mike Brun puts it, it's a gangplank. So now, while we have only walked out on the gangplank a couple of feet, and can theoretically make it back to the deck of our battered spaceship Earth, let's clarify the two conflicting uses of the deceptive term natural gas. Wellhead gas and refinery gas. You know those pretty portraits of the Earth's crust that the gas industry likes to put in their advertisements? At the top is the happy light blue atmosphere, then the happy green plants on the healthy brown topsoil, maybe with a happy healthy city in the background, then a happy, healthy, deep blue aquifer, then a black layer of solid, secure rock, then a dark brown layer of shale full of happy, clean molecules of natural gas, just waiting for healthy drilling rigs to safely run through the aquifer without ever hurting it, down through the solid rock into the shale where it turns right and gives a safe, healthy, happy path back to the surface to keep the half happy, healthy city humming along. Well, it turns out that that's not what the Earth's crust actually looks like. It's messy. There are rock fractures and water flow patterns all over the place. And when hydrocarbons were formed from decaying, compressed plant life a long time ago, they weren't always so neat and tight either. Sometimes these millennial geologic processes created solid hydrocarbons, like coal and Colorado's misnamed oil shale, and the bitumen that constitutes the misnamed tar sands of Alberta. Sometimes we got liquid hydrocarbons, like the many forms of oil, and sometimes gaseous, like methane, ethane, propane, butane, etc. And they are often, usually, mixed together, 
Methane is a constant danger in most coal mines, for example, and gaseous hydrocarbons and heavy oil are mixed together in an especially toxic, highly flammable stew in the Bakken region of North Dakota. These messy mixes are why our engineers developed refineries, so we could grab the hydrocarbons we want for each specific industrial revolution purpose. So at the wellhead, natural gas is invariably one of these mixtures. And when it leaks, as it always does sooner or later, it leaks all this stuff, which is why there is a new, permanent, toxic, atmospheric soup in the fracking regions of North America now. At the refinery, wellhead gas is more or less broken down into its constituent parts, which often include other things along with multiple gaseous hydrocarbons like mercury, other heavy metals, radon gas. But post-refinery, the redefined natural gas is essentially 100% methane for consumer use with a tiny percentage of odorant added so you can escape your kitchen before it blows up. And that leads us to old fracking and new fracking. Hydraulic fracturing of messy rock and hydrocarbon formations was first developed after World War II as a way of getting more oil and gas out of conventional vertically drilled wells. And this old fracking worked, albeit with leakage, spills, and so on. But then our creative technology moved just a decade ago. We developed horizontal drilling and then, your tax dollars at work, with subsidies we developed a new blend of horizontal directional drilling with new mini explosions into hydrocarbon infused shale beds using specialty toxic chemicals, specialty sand and massive quantities of water to create new fracking with the natural gas production boom that has resulted. So when the industry says that we've been fracking for 60 years with no problems, the first part, the time frame, is intentionally disingenuous, conflating two very different processes. And the second part is just a lie. We now know that new fracking creates a whole raft of new and enhanced problems that are, in most cases, insoluble. But we do need methane. It has a value to civilization, as well as presenting huge danger. It is the most versatile hydrocarbon and the most misused. Various components of wellhead gas are vital to industrial manufacturing processes, notably among them plastics, whose major virtues include flexibility of design and technique and permanence. Plastic versatility is vital for all kinds of useful productive components in our culture, such as it is, and even in the kind of healthy, sustainable culture we're trying to develop. So why are we letting globalized corporate oligopolies create single-use plastic? We need to preserve methane and other gaseous hydrocarbons for a well-regulated set of manufacturing processes for goods that provide genuine social benefit as the climate and economic crises continue to cascade upon us. For transportation, there is a significant push for compressed natural gas. And that doesn't make any sense either. The solution for transportation is almost entirely electricity. Uh, that can be done and we need to be doing it now, more now. Most of the growth in methane use though has been for electrical generation. As wellhead gas got cheaper because of new fracking and coal-fired electrical generation got more costly because of long overdue environmental and pollution control costs. Gas-fired plants have replaced coal across the country. This gives us the current contradiction between gas electricity and renewable electricity. We're facing baseload and peaking power versus wind and solar energy. Methane is great for generating electricity. Just light it up and use the heat to turn a turbine. Works for both baseload power and for the high demand peaking power loads, like air conditioning during our planet's increasingly frequent hot days. Renewable energy, on the other hand, specifically wind and solar photovoltaic, requires new and better engineering and changes in attitudes. Smart grids, more efficiency, more conservation, which is to say less use, and storage systems and other tools to deal with intermittent supply. But so what? Engineers love to solve engineering problems, and the technical and economic tools for renewables are fully available right now. The only barriers are political and corporate, and methane is one of the most potent of the many corporate habits that are destroying our atmospheric and ocean stability. So it's crazy to invest in multi-decade infrastructure projects that use natural gas to generate electricity. 
Kurt Vonnegut once said that humans are the only species that won't save itself because it is not cost effective. Well, we can't use that as an excuse anymore because it is cost effective. Naomi Klein has just demonstrated that with her remarkable new book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. That's the issue that we need to face in terms of the conversions that we need to make in our society. One of the most destructive misuses of methane, though, in this binary battle, is to chill it to make LNG, liquefied natural gas, so the local and regional markets for it can be globalized in corporate trade deals to make it into a major global ex export commodity like oil. This leads to the contradiction between so-called energy security and LNG exports. Liquefying methane is hugely energy intensive. It has to be cooled to minus 261 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and then put onto tankers as a liquid, shipped across the ocean, and then regasified at the other end to be used by the end users in the destination countries. When liquefied natural gas proposals originally came to Oregon and the rest of the United States, uh, they were import proposals uh, and projects and pitched heavily on the basis of long-term energy security. We can bring methane in from other countries that will help us. But in the meantime, we develop new fracking, and now uh, we have a much higher supply of natural gas. So that gives us now a smidgen of conflict between the 1% and the rest of us. The federal government has a statutory responsibility to assess whether exporting natural gas is good for the United States, whether it serves the public interest. And the U.S. Department of Energy did a uh, major study. They contracted with a coal consultant uh, who determined that it's only bad for the 99 percent. It's only bad for people who actually live on wages or fixed income and use products that are manufactured uh, for people who are the owners of the gross domestic product, the one percent, it is a net plus. There are about two dozen LNG export proposals and active projects on our three coasts, but only two on the west coast, both in Oregon. They are aimed at pulling massive amounts of frack gas out of the entire western half of North America. Each of these gigantic industrial plants and the pipelines to serve them plan to export about a billion cubic feet of methane a day. So two billion between the two of them. That's more, each of those is more, together more than double, uh, the entire daily use of natural gas in the state of Oregon. And by comparison, the United States uses about 75 billion cubic feet per day currently. These proposals are aimed at the corners of the Oregon coast at Astoria and Coos Bay. And the binary contradiction that we face here uh, is, is a particularly interesting one politically because it also leads to a contradiction between eco-warriors, those who want a long-term sustainable planet, and some of the uh, sadly misguided leadership of the building trades. The building trades in our labor movement, which is so vital to the economic health of America, uh, live project by project. They are used to 18-month deals, and um, big projects are very important to their membership. And they face really serious and severe problems uh, for members in their 40s and 50s and 60s, for example. They still have, as a result of the Great Recession, uh, an unemployment rate 50 percent or more in a lot of cases. Really outrageous. Uh, another example of the one percent social attacks on our society. But the answer to those problems is not to build climate destroying massive industrial facilities based on the traditional fossil fuel economy that has turned us across these tipping points 
into climate disruption and overall atmospheric and ocean destruction? The answer is to build new, good, clean, sustainable green jobs. And there's two ways in which we need to be doing that. We face here in Oregon and Washington, Northern California, and Southern British Columbia, the largest earthquake zone in North America. We sit on the Cascadia Fault, a subduction zone, and it pops every 250 to 400 years at magnitude 8 to magnitude 9. Never less, because it is not a slip fault like the San Andreas Fault. It's a subduction zone like the massive 2003 earthquake uh, in the day after Christmas in Indonesia that killed 200,000 people in Indonesia, Thailand, uh, India, and Sri Lanka, and the 2011 Tohoku Fukushima quake uh, that is the mirror image of our situation here on the Oregon coast. Placing explosive 20-story liquefaction tanks for liquefied natural gas uh, and pipelines along the pathways in our forests to deal with uh, this 1% program is not a sensible prospect for a region that is guaranteed to suffer the largest natural disaster in United States history. The last time the subduction zone popped, the Cascadia zone popped, was January 29th of 1700, long before white people invaded this part of the world. And uh, that's 314 years into this 250 to 400 year cycle. There is more than, sometimes it's a bit longer, sometimes it's shorter. Uh, there's more than a 50-50 chance that this will happen in the next 50 years. Uh, and that is the minimum duration for which these liquefied natural gas plants wish to exist. So the kinds of jobs that we need to solve the problems for the building trades and the problems for our society and our, our economy are good, clean, green jobs, renewable energy jobs, and seismic protection and tsunami protection jobs. That's the path that we need to get on. And that's really why the challenge of methane is one of the most important and most troublesome, one of the most elegant and one of the most tangled problems that we face today. Great. Thank you very much, Ted, for, for that Thank insightful you, uh, analysis. I appreciate Good. the opportunity. Good. Good. Always right. a pleasure. Our guest today has been Ted Gleichman, chair of the Beyond LNG Committee of the Oregon Sierra Club, and he has been talking about the yin and yang of methane. Don't forget that you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populist dialogues to view most of our past shows. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you will automatically receive an email notification. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. Thank you to Roger Bates, Melissa Hayes, Brad Leach, Dan Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And thanks to all of you for watching. I hope that we'll see you all again in a couple weeks. Bye. This Changes Everything is really about this central tension we have between an economic model that is built to facilitate short-term profits and, uh, and growth and, a, and a, a planet, a, a biosphere, that is overloaded. The industry at the heart of this, the fossil fuel industry and the banks that underwrite that industry, are so powerful because of uh, how in 
intensely profitable this economic model is, they've essentially merged with government. We can get off that road. We can veer, but that requires changing our economic system. And we can only do that if we change our political system. You know, we need to transform on every level, but underneath all of that, we need to we need to confront the outsized power of, of money in politics so that those other changes are possible. Yeah, I call the book This Changes Everything because um, we have procrastinated for so long in the face of the climate crisis that there are no now no non-radical options uh, in front of us. If we stay on the road we're on, then everything changes about our physical world and not in a good way. Important. I do think it is important to address campaign law, mm -hmm. but I do. But but we also need to address c corporate personhood. Um, I don't think we can get around that. Um, so we have to have a holistic approach to. To, to these various problems. I don't think there is a silver bullet. Um, I think we, we, need to, um, we need to look at, at, at both the campaign finance um, and, and corporate personhood as well. To move to amend is, is a key part of, of a series of actions that we need to take to get money out of politics. If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock Cause I never heard my money talk When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I'll believe they're human like me Remember NAFTA? The United States, Mexico, and Canada were to benefit from better jobs, enhanced environmental protections, improved trade balances, in order to build a stronger middle class. Instead, American jobs and manufacturing were sent abroad. Mexican farmers were forced to migrate to the United States, and environmental standards went under attack. NAFTA has been a race to the bottom for jobs, wages, and environmental standards. Now President Obama is negotiating a NAFTA on steroids for the Pacific Rim. And he's doing this in secret. What do they have to hide? Call your congressional representative today at 202-224-3121 and demand a copy of the Trans-Pacific Partnership text. We need to know what's being done in our name before it becomes law. Learn more at OregonFairTrade.org and get involved now with the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign.